No? Yeah. yeah. Whoa. That's scary. Yeah, I, o I only take issue with the cover of the bulletin. You notice what it said? Yeah. Welcome back, Reverend Alan Jackson and Carol. It ain't necessarily so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I hope that bottom line doesn't refer to the stuff above. Well, uh, to get into that ain't necessarily so, so stuff, we gotta go to the book of Acts. This is uh, Luke volume two, you know. I mean, in case you don't know that, Luke wrote two documents. The first one uh, we call the gospel according to St. Luke. Volume two uh, is Luke's uh, account of the church after Jesus ascended to heaven and we were obliged to carry on. And so we're looking at Luke volume two, it's the book of Acts chapter 10. And let's start at verse one and go through verse eight and then we're gonna jump over to verse 23. I'm reading from the New International Version. Uh, most of the versions are gonna sound pretty much alike, but this is large print and so <laughs> that's why I've got it. All right. Before we do that, let's pray. God, this is your word, and uh, you promised that your word would not return to you empty-handed, but would accomplish what you set it out to do. I pray that that would be the case today with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Look right, at Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial, memorial offering before God. Now, send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who's called Peter. He's staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel had spoke to him and gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants, he told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. Okay, now we get to verse 23 because what happens in between is a whole other story. And it's about Peter, but we'll do that another time. Uh, so, verse 23, then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I'm only a man myself. Talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you're well aware that it's against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him. But God has shown me, oh boy did he show it, but God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> uh, there's an old saying, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck and looks like a duck, chances are pretty dang good that it's a duck. 
But I'm here to tell you with a nod to George Gershwin that it ain't necessarily so. For example, he came to the podium to receive the coveted Community Service Award in San Francisco. His work in the neighborhood across the city had all the signs of being blessed by God. His ministry had reached the marginalized. Those who had been written off by the majority of society found a place and welcome with him. He quoted scripture like it was part of him, and he, he could preach. Man, could he preach. People came from all walks of life, blue collar, white collar, professionals, rich, poor, black, brown, white, you name it, to hear him preach God's word. Jim Jones walked like a preacher, talked like a preacher, looked like a preacher, and so everyone assumed that this charismatic man was a man of God, a man you could follow. But it ain't necessarily so. And for those of you who are too young to remember, just Google Jim Jones, People's Temple, Jonestown, November 18th, 1978. And don't take any Kool-Aid from him. Or on a less violent note, uh, consider the Apostle Peter. If you were asked to assess the spiritual maturity of the acknowledged leader of the early Christian church, most of us would probably rate him as something of a spiritual giant, right? After all, he'd proven himself to be a fearless preacher. He was an amazing healer. But even this Holy Spirit-filled, miracle-working, board-certified apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ needed a major attitude overhaul when it came to his arrogance and his prejudice. So I suppose, once again, you could say, it ain't necessarily so. That is, there's more to a person than the packaging. God alone knows the heart. But today I want us to take a closer look at another man who seemed to have it all together, both physically and spiritually. By any measure, Cornelius was quite the man. He was career military a centurion in the Roman army stationed at Caesarea on the Mediterranean coast about 30 miles north of Joppa. You get a sense of the man's probable temperament from the Roman historian Polybius. This is what Polybius, how he describes centurions as a group, okay? Polybius writes, not so much venturesome daredevils as natural leaders of a steady and sedate spirit. Not so much men who will initiate attacks and open the battle as men who will hold their ground when worsted and hard-pressed and be ready to die at their post. So most likely, as with other centurions, Cornelius was one solid man. What's more, and you may already know this, every centurion who appears in the New Testament is presented in a positive light. Did you know that? According to the record, the first Gentile with whom Jesus had any dealings in his public ministry was a centurion in Caesarea who, uh, uh, who came and asked Jesus to heal uh, his servant. You know the story? It's, it, it is a neat story. I, we got time, right? You're not going anywhere. Matthew chapter 8. It, this, this is just so cool. When Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, uh, my servant lies at home paralyzed and he's in terrible suffering. Jesus said to him, okay, I'll go heal him. The centurion replied, replied Lord, I, I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. But just 
Say the word, and my servant will be healed. I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. I tell another one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, he does it. Just say the word. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished and said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Wow. Jesus only singled out two people in his entire ministry, at least in the record, only singled out two people for their great faith, this centurion and an unnamed Syrophoenician woman who came asking for help with her sick daughter. <laughs> Neat. Wow. Now the other one uh, that comes to mind is the centurion, you know, the scene at, at the crucifixion. At the record of Jesus' death, there was a centurion there on that hill who looked up and in that horrible mess of a day, he looked up and saw the way Jesus died and he said, surely this was the son of God. A centurion recognized that. And in Acts chapter 27, just to, you know, a little frosting on the cake, there's a centurion there near the end of, of the book of Acts, a centurion named Julius who treated Paul as a prisoner more like a brother than as a prisoner. These centurions were good men. They were honorable. And Cornelius was one of them. There's more. Luke tells us that Cornelius and his whole family were devout and God-fearing. You know, Romans could worship whichever deity they chose, uh, whichever one they thought might benefit them the most. But Cornelius decided to worship and reverence the God of Israel alone. His choice. What's more, he was a godly family man. He taught his family the same reverence for God. He's a neat guy. Add to that the fact that he walked his talk, as they say. That is, he lived his faith in his daily life. Luke says that he gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. And then Luke tells us that Cornelius was blessed with a personal visit of a heavenly messenger who told him that his goodness had not gone unnoticed. That his life was a sacrifice pleasing to God. Hey, when was the last time you were singled out by a personal visit from an angel and told, that, told you that your life was a blessing to God? <laughs> okay, this is some guy. And not only that, when the angel told Cornelius to send men to Joppa to bring some stranger back, he didn't hesitate. He didn't sit down to analyze the vision, try to explain it away. He didn't even ask God for a confirmation, for a second opinion, like Gideon did. Remember Gideon? You know, Lord, could you just make this fleece stay dry when the ground's wet? Okay, and tomorrow morning, let's, let's do the reverse. None of that. No. No testing of God. Cornelius simply obeyed. That's how the man operated. It was almost second nature for him to do exactly what God told him to do. Can there be any question that this guy was one of God's chosen people? You remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. Well, Cornelius did exactly what God told him to do. He was a perfect picture of obedience. I'm impressed, aren't you? I mean, now you needn't answer this question, but, but consider this. In your opinion, did Cornelius have it all together spiritually? Could we say with some assurance that before he met Peter, 
Cornelius was saved. Could we consider him a, a Christian in the truest sense of the term? If all we knew about Cornelius was what we read there in Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 8, what would you say? Would you say that he stood in a right relationship with Almighty God or not? For some people here, that answer, the answer to that may seem obvious. And that could be true whether you see Cornelius being in or out. But for many people, I suspect, that that may be really a tough question. You've heard people say, undoubtedly, of some people, uh, who, somebody who's really good, well, he's more of a Christian than a lot of Christians I know. Well, was Cornelius a Christian? Before we cast our votes, listen to what Luke has to say. He tells us that Peter went to Cornelius' house in Caesarea, and after exchanging the appropriate greetings, Peter said to Cornelius, may I ask why you sent for me? And Cornelius told him about his vision, and then pointing to all of his friends and relations who had gathered there in his house, he said, we are all here, this is Cornelius speaking, okay? We are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. I tell you, if a preacher gets an invitation like that and doesn't know what to do, he's got to be comatose. And so Peter began his teaching by saying this, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. And then he, he began to tell them all about Jesus. But as he was teaching, the most amazing thing happened. You know the story? If you don't, you got to read it. It is so cool. Uh, Luke says that Peter was in the middle of explaining how anyone who believes in Jesus receives forgiveness of sins. You remember the eraser thing a while ago? Okay. Anyone who believes in Jesus receives forgiveness of sins. Suddenly, the Holy Spirit descended, paid a house call on this house full of Gentiles, and they all began speaking in a language that they didn't learn. Praising God in unlearned languages. Right in the middle of the sermon. I can imagine poor Peter thinking, wait, wait, no, hold on, I'm not finished. I, look, I haven't even gotten to my best material yet. What? Whoa. I, I mean, you're supposed to wait for the altar call. What, what's going on here? And the six believers who came from Joppa, who were there with Peter, were just as surprised as he was. Thank heavens they had the good sense to realize that they had a whole house full of new believers who needed to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. So they did it. Wow. Now, what are we to make of this story? Just this. The Cornelius we met in the first eight verses of Acts chapter 10 was not a Christian. Okay. He was devout. He feared God. He gave generously to the poor. He prayed regularly. God's angel even paid him a visit. And he was obedient to God's command. But he was not a Christian. And even though this remarkable man may have walked like a Christian and talked like a Christian, and prayed like a Christian, and gave like a Christian, as I said before, it ain't necessarily so. 
But I'm here to tell you that God didn't call you here this morning to vote on whether or not Cornelius had it made. God arranged for you to be here today because he wants to do for you what he did for Cornelius and company. Now, I imagine there are those of you who will be thinking, well, you know, (laughs) this is obviously a sermon for those people who never joined church. And I've been in church for years. As a matter of fact, I've been in Sunday school and church every single Sunday of my life since I was a baby. I mean, the, the church is like my second home. If that's your response, I would caution you to avoid rationalizing away an opportunity for God to move in on you and give you the full life that can only be found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. You may have been in church for years, or this may be the first time you ever attended a Christian service of worship. That is not the issue. What matters is that God has called you here today to do business with you and to open your eyes to the glory that rests in Jesus alone. Some may say, well, look, I know I'm a Christian because I read the Bible every day. Well, you may feel like you're a Christian because you study the Bible religiously, but I'm here to tell you it ain't necessarily so. And others might say, well, I know I'm a Christian because I've been tithing and I've been giving to the less fortunate ever since I got my first allowance and I have never missed an opportunity since. You may feel you're a Christian because you tithe and then give even more, but I'm here to tell you that it ain't necessarily so. And there are others who would say, well, I know I'm a Christian because I, I never miss worship. In fact, I have a 20-year perfect attendance pin from Sunday school. You may indeed feel that you're a Christian because you never miss church. But I'm here to tell you that it ain't necessarily so. And there are those who would say, in all sincerity, I pray to God for at least an hour every single day of my life, and so I know in my heart that I'm a Christian. Well, Cornelius prayed all the time too, and if he were here, he would be the first to tell you, it ain't necessarily so. Guys, I'm not here this morning to ask you how often you go to church or how well you give, I'm here to ask you if you have ever asked Jesus Christ to forgive your sins and to come into your heart and take up residence there as your Lord and Savior. Praying is good, but it doesn't wash away your sins. Being devout is good, But devotion doesn't wash away your sins. Giving is very good. And we all need to give. But giving has no power to take away your sin. Only God can forgive sinners. And today he would do that for you and give you the gift of life in Christ forever. Please, make it so. Let's pray. Lord, if there's anyone here today Uh, who, like, like me, has questioned whether or not this is all real, who's uh, held back because, well, inertia is a really strong force and 
nothing really terrible has happened to me yet, so why do anything different if it ain't broke? If there's anyone here today, Lord, who says, oh, I'm, I'm doing the best I can and I'm just going to coast and trust that it'll all pan out in the end. God, if there's anyone here today who senses the tugging of your spirit on his heart, on her heart, saying, why not? Why, why, why not just set aside your reservations and say to God something like this, God, I'm not here to test you. I'm not here waiting for you to prove anything. I'm willing, at least for now, to be here to be tested. To, to put me on the line and say, God, take me and do with me what you will. I hand over the reins to you. I, I relinquish my long-cherished right to run my own life. And I ask you of your mercy to be my Lord and my Savior. If there's anyone, Lord, today for whom that picture rings true, then, Lord, I ask you to make of my words their words as well. Lord, come into my heart. Take over. Rummage around. I give you free reign to, to uh, open up any hampers of dirty clothes and, and, and uh, hidden corners and stuff like that. Lord, just take over my life and clean it up. And I'll trust you to do it. And however much it may hurt at the time, I'll trust you that it will be so flippin' much better after you've done it. God, please, please save me. Because right now I, I do understand I can't save myself. And there may be one or two of us today who... Uh, who made that commitment maybe a long, long time ago. And the luster has worn off and the parts have gotten rusty from misuse or non-use. I gave my life to you once, Lord, and then uh, bed by bed I've taken some of it back and uh, tried to regain some of my <laughs> losses only to realize I'm still a loser without you. God, for, for any here today for whom this is the time to say, I, I want to come home. I've squandered too much of the family inheritance I'm not worthy to be called your son. Just take me on as one of your servants. If there's any here today for whom this is a, this is a time to make a fresh start. God, let this be the day. And our lives will give you all the praise. Through Christ our Lord, who taught us as your children to pray together this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So, go into the world in peace. Have good courage. Hold on to what's good. Return to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor everybody. And rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the peace of Christ be with us all every day. Amen. Amen.